Discovery Houston. April 1985, Space Shuttle Discovery is in orbit. The mission started out normally enough with Telesat-1, a Canadian communications satellite being spring ejected from the cargo bay. During the crew's second day in space, SINCOM-4 was deployed. Everything seemed to be going as planned. The crew watched expectantly for the omnidirectional antenna on top of the satellite to raise to its standing position. However... Houston, uh, uh, this is Discovery. We are watching the CENCOM. The Omni antenna is still down. Roger, Ray, uh, any kind of visual assessment you can give us of the CENCOM uh, spin-up, et cetera, would be appreciated. Uh, we sure like any kind of good photos you can be taking at this time, too. Yes, sir. The Omni is still down, and we're trying to watch the spin-up. Discovery. About 45 minutes after deployment from the cargo bay, the firing of SINCOM's perigee kick motor, which would start the satellite on its way to geosynchronous orbit, did not occur. Apparently a switch lever on the side of the satellite didn't activate when it came out of the cargo bay. So the people on the ground began to search for a way to trip that switch. One thing they had to keep in mind was that anything that we used uh, to actually trip the switch had to be constructed from materials that we already had on board. And what they came up with was a couple of homemade devices, and we called them la the lacrosse stick and the fly swatter. And they were basically made out of some metal tubing, some plastic book covers that we had on our checklist, a metal window shade, uh, also some wire and some gray tape that we carry on board on, the, on every flight. Um, the devices were going to be attached to the end of the robot arm. The whole procedure for making and using these devices went through a trial run on the ground. Uh, they did runs in the weightless environment training facility where the spacesuit procedures are tested. Uh, they did some uh, work in the arm training facility with a mock-up of the CINCOM satellite to see actually what would work. Uh, the mission was extended for a couple of days so we could rendezvous with the satellite. And during that time, Mission Control sent up a massive amount of information on the teleprinter. That included uh, detailed instructions for building the fly swatter and, in fact, an entire rendezvous checklist. Mission specialists Jeff Hoffman and David Griggs prepared for the EVA. While mission specialist Ray Seddon maneuvered the robot arm into a convenient place for Hoffman and Griggs to attach the fly swatter devices to the end effector. Howdy, we've got a good picture of you. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I want to caution you that you're getting your pliss and maybe the helmet into the fly swatter there. you got to be careful that you don't get those things to bend up. Oh, okay, I'll try to move around. Easy, hold it, Jeff. Don't do anything. Okay. At Discovery Houston, you just got a round of applause. Thanks for the work. Hey, you're welcome. The next day, Commander Carol Bobko and Pilot Don Williams maneuvered the shuttle into position for the rendezvous with SINCOM. I guess there was some question as to whether the arm could be used in this way. We were using some rather primitive tools on the end of the arm to see if we could tug on a separation switch uh, and activate a satellite. We counted at least three really good whacks at it, uh, but then the window of time in which correct activation was possible ended. Since we'd made hard contact with the switch, we had to back off from it in case the booster rocket was going to fire. Uh, the Omni antenna never did come up, but NASA decided that further attempts uh, would not be made to try and trip the switch. On the ground, Hughes Aircraft Company engineers performed an extensive failure analysis during the weeks that followed Mission 51D. This analysis led to the development of two separate electronics units designed to activate the dormant satellite. In the months following Mission 51D, NASA and Hughes agreed to develop plans for a shuttle mission to attempt to salvage SINCOM. This joint effort was based largely on experience gained by NASA during the Solar Max repair mission and the retrieval of Palapa and Westar. One, ignition, and liftoff. Liftoff, the 
On August 27, 1985, Space Shuttle Mission 51I was launched. Among the objectives of this mission was to capture and repair the ailing SINCOM satellite. On flight day two, maneuvers to rendezvous with SINCOM began. Once rendezvous operations were completed, the salvage and repair process could begin. Mission specialists James Ox Van Hoften and Bill Fisher prepared for the repair in the cargo bay, while mission specialist Mike Lounge operated the robot arm. And Commander Joe Engel and pilot Richard Covey monitored their progress. Bill Fisher describes the operation. Ox secured himself in the foot restraints that were located on the end of the robot arm and was then moved into position to grab the satellite. Once Ox had gained manual control of the satellite, he was able to move it simply by pushing and turning it. At the controls of the robot arm, Mike carefully maneuvered Ox with the satellite in hand down toward me in the payload bay. I went to work repairing the satellite. This included some rewiring and also the installation of some electronics boxes which would enable us to deploy the Omni antenna and also to establish communication between the satellite and Hughes Ground Control. Okay, Omni, deploy, fire. Omni, fire, here she comes, looking good. Looking good, buddy. All right. Bye, bye, bye. This is Mission Control. Today's extravehicular activity lasted seven hours and eight minutes. This broke the previous record by one minute. The repairs required for CENCOM were time consuming and two EVAs were required to complete the job. On the second EVA, we installed a new perigee kick motor cover, removed the safe and arming pins, and set the timers on the electronics box that would eventually allow Hughes ground control to communicate with the satellite. We then installed a spin-up bar for AUX. On the end of the robot arm, Ox used the spin-up bar to position the satellite and then gave it a push to start the necessary rotations. Okay, we copy. That's great work, everybody. I can still see the timers blinking. Still at work. Yeah, I do too. The mission had been a success. Once again, NASA had demonstrated the skills necessary to efficiently work in space. And I think we're going to find in the future that the whole concept of repairing things and maintaining them is just going to become a gradually uh, more and more accepted idea uh, that will make the space program just that much more robust and that much more inexpensive. It will cut some of the expense in the uh, space program. Experiences gained on Skylab and these space shuttle missions are the foundation on which space station operations of the future will be built. With the combination of a manned base and automated systems, the servicing of satellites will become routine, as will the deployment and operation of scientific instrument platforms. Capabilities not yet dreamed of. A future within our reach as we continue to build towards new heights.